Why hello you amazing beautiful people and welcome back to another reaction video. So today once again We are doing a random reaction. This one was actually recommended to me by my good friend Judd If you don't know who he is, he's a twitch streamer. He also has a YouTube channel now I've linked to I'll leave a link to his YouTube channel in the description. Go give him a subscribe um, But yeah, this has been recommended by him every now and then we do these random reactions check out random different like Historical videos or funny stories or stuff like that usually recommended from all of you So if you have any other videos like this you'd like me to react to Put your recommendations down below in that comment section. I know they're a bit like left field, but they have been really enjoyable. And this one right here, the rescue of Jessica uh, Buchanan or Buchanan, is a story I've never heard of, never heard her name before, know nothing about, and I'm just just kind of curious. So we're gonna jump straight into this one. Complete blind reaction from me. Let's find out. Let's react to it for the first time. Don't forget to like. Don't forget to subscribe. And let's jump into my first time ever blind reaction to the rescue of Jessica Buchanan. For the first time, we have the story of the rescue of Jessica Buchanan. Buchanan. It is the tale of a secret mission by SEAL... I apologize. I completely butchered her, her surname. Buchanan. Jessica Buchanan. Okay, my bad. I do apologize. Team 6 that few people have heard about until now. On a January night in 2012, members of SEAL Team 6 jumped from a plane into the skies of Somalia. Jessica Buchanan was being held hostage, and the SEALs were descending just in time. Buchanan was a humanitarian aid worker who had come to help children in one of the most dangerous places on Earth. Hers was an ordeal that ended in a flash of violence, but had begun 93 days earlier when her car was stopped by bandits in a place she calls hell. The story will continue in a moment. Hmm? Was this like, what was going on? We stopped very abruptly, like so oh, abruptly that I felt like, like everybody Carrie just Fisher. fall forward. And then I start hearing all of this pounding on the windows and the windshield and all this shouting in Somali. And there's a man standing there screaming and he has an AK-47 and he's shouting and he's pointing it at us. And then he climbs into the car next to me and he points an AK in my face and they're hyped up like they're on speed and all of a sudden we just take off. The driver just takes off and we just start slamming all over the place down these camel tracks. What did you think they were going to do? I figured they were going to rape me and then kill me. And I just keep thinking this can't be the end. This can't be the end of my life. I'm only 32 years old. I haven't had any children yet. I didn't get to say goodbye to Eric. I, I, I didn't get to say goodbye to my dad. Like this can't be the end. Jessica Buchanan was facing the end at the end of the earth. Did, uh, at the beginning, didn't they say she was like, like a humanitarian or something? She's out there for like assistance. It's crazy that things like this happen in the world, but what's it even, what it makes it even worse is whenever you hear a story like this, it always happens to someone who's just a, like good for the world, you know? Like someone who's like doing good for the world. Someone who just, the, like the last person you would ever expect to have any kind of negative things happen to them. Someone who's literally out in this country to help people in that country going through this, it's just horrible. Somalia, on the farthest tip of Africa, is war-torn and lawless. This is essentially no man's land. He went to Militias Somalia. Militias battle over oh, an unforgiving land, as we saw while covering a famine there in 2011. It was the same year that Buchanan was with a Danish charity teaching children how to avoid landmines. On October 25th, her car was hijacked. The driver is driving like just a madman we're bouncing all help. over the place my head keeps hitting the window it keeps hitting the roof i'm holding on to the the side uh, the handle on the land cruiser just trying to keep myself steady what happened next it gets dark and we've changed vehicles a couple of times more people have come they're screaming and i hear from behind me a higher pitched voice going on and on in somali and i think my God, they have a woman involved in this. And I turn around and I see a small child in the back of the Land Cruiser with an AK-47 draped in 
ammunition. And I think the irony <laughs> of, of why I came to Africa in the first place. Exactly the kid you were trying to save, a child soldier. Yeah. What was he doing? Learning the trade. She'd been kidnapped along with a co-worker, Paul Thisted. They drove into the night and then were ordered to march into the desert. And they tell us to get down onto our knees. I am, I do apologize. I don't know what this reaction is gonna be like. I'm just, just shocked. Um, so I know I'm supposed to give like commentary and everything like that, but I honestly don't even know what to say. I'm, I'm shocked. I'm shocked. I'm glad the, ti the title kind of spoils the ending. I'm glad she gets rescued. I hope she doesn't go through too much before that happens. Did they say it's 90 days? I, I, I cannot imagine what this must be like for a person. All of us who just like live a normal life, go to an office or just do whatever, you know, normal day jobs, driving to work, coming home, eating our dinner. <laughs> These are people just like us. And this, something like this happens. This is insane. And I think, okay, this is it. Like I'm- I missed that bit. Also the fact that it was, a, she saw a child as well in the back after she's gone out there to help And they them. tell us to get down onto our knees. And I think, okay, this is it. Like I'm bracing myself to be shot in the back of the head. And I think that there's mercy in the fact that maybe they're not going to rape me first, but that it's just going to be quick. And I'm waiting and I'm waiting. And then all of a sudden somebody shouts from behind us, sleep. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I didn't hear that correctly, did I? He just said sleep. She collapsed, slept through the night, and, then he and the next the morning was met over. by the man who led the bandits. And we ask him, are you going to kill us? Is that why we're here? He says, no, 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 no. Money. We just want money. How much were they asking for? They started out at $45 million. They thought you were pretty valuable. I guess so. The casualness of that. Are you gonna kill us? Oh, no, 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 we're not gonna kill you. Money, we just want money. The casualness of that. They've literally kidnapped these people, dragged them through the desert, pointing guns at them the whole time, told them to kneel out in the middle of nowhere. And when they ask whether or not they're gonna live, like, oh, no, 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 you're silly. We just want money. The fucking casualness. The bandits used her cell phone to call her husband, Eric Landemom. The two had married on an African beach two years before. But his number and the numbers of Buchanan's family had all been disconnected. It was part of the charity's emergency plan. The one number that worked was her Nairobi office with a hostage negotiator standing by. And so- Wait, they, so all the numbers had been disconnected other than one. So if a phone was ever taken, th so this is, this, they, this is a, conting a contingency check. They're like, they plan for something like this happening. So they, they had a feeling that something like this could happen. They're like, as a safety thing, in case you get kidnapped, all your numbers are disconnected apart from one, which is a hostage negotiation. All of them. I don't know whether or not that's, that's both terrifying and genius. Was her Nairobi office with a hostage negotiator standing by. And so began months of talks. Where did they keep you? Day in, day out. Under trees. And outside. You were outdoors for 93 days? Mm-hmm. Yep. And in, in the night, they forced us to sleep out in the open. What were the nights like? Long and cold. Then the rainy season hit, and it would rain all night long, and you're already freezing, so then you're sitting there wet. What were you eating? Tuna fish. Maybe once a day, um, we would get a small can of tuna fish and a piece of bread. Did you feel like you were beginning to lose your humanity at any point? Yeah, I mean, they treated us like animals. How many... To be so sick that, you know, you're vomiting behind bushes and 
you can't walk straight when you're laying in the fetal position on the ground under a tree and they don't even, they don't care. She is incredible. She is fucking incredible. The only reason I'm not like emotional with this horrible story is because she's not and I'm struggling. But look how strong she is. Everything she went through, she's able to recap and tell this story like she is. What an incredibly strong human. Their duty was to keep me from dying because then I wasn't worth anything. They were in the hands of men and boys who were chewing cot. It's a plant with the same effect as amphetamines. They were so hyped up um, on speed. It was like drinking pot after pot of coffee and then the crash would come and, and then it brought a lot of belligerence and, and a lot of uh, anger and a lot of temper. You and Paul came up with nicknames for a lot of the people who were keeping you. That's one of the ways you kept yourself occupied. We did. The 10-year-old boy? Crack baby, because he was cracked out all the time. He was chewing cot and he had two black holes for eyes. There was nothing inside. This is one of the camps where she was held. The bandits hit her, pointed their guns at her, and put a knife to her throat. But it was exposure that took a toll. She lost 25 pounds. After three weeks, the bandits made a video to prove that she was alive. Have you seen the video? I have. Paul and myself, Jessica, we are safe and we are alive. I can tell I'm starting to lose hope at that point. But hope would have to last for two more months. As the many weeks went by, did you think the American she looks like a different person. Ah. Oh. I think it's so easy for people to detach themselves from stories sometimes. Like we watch documentaries on Netflix and about like killers and, and, and these horrible things that have happened. And it's really easy to detach yourself from like the fact that these are people like us. Unless you've been like, unless you've been like related to someone, you never really feel it. So it's easy to watch this and just think of it as like any other story we're being told as like an entertainment factor. But when you think like, this could literally be your sister, this could be your mum, this could be someone in your family that like just has such a good heart that they just want to give back to the world, so selfless, and then they go through this. You know, the one person that you would be like, oh, they were so kind and so giving and so sweet, and then this horrible thing happened. I, it's, it's fucking disgusting. It's so sad. As the many weeks went by, did you think the American government's watching me, they know where I am, and somebody's gonna get me out of here? No. Why? Because I'm just an aid worker. You didn't imagine that the President of the United States knew your name? Never. Never in a million years. After three months in the desert, Buchanan had a serious urinary tract infection. And in a final call to the hostage negotiator, she said this. I had become so ill that I couldn't stand up. I couldn't walk. So I was in so much pain. And I said, I think I have a kidney infection. And I started to cry and I said, I think I'm afraid I'm going to die out here. When that call was received here in Nairobi, it Three set months, off a chain man. of events that led all the way to the Oval Office. The FBI and the military consulted doctors who said that if Jessica had a kidney infection, she might have just two weeks to live. That was transmitted to the president, who was also informed that in just a few days, there would be a new moon, perfect darkness for a SEAL Team rescue. Jessica Buchanan had chosen a star in the Somali sky to represent her mother. I know this is completely um, random, but the, I swear, like, the other night we had something like that. Because here in the UK, it was pitch black last night. It was, like, pitch black. It got really dark. Even my wife commented on it, and I noticed it. Oh, and, like, I had, like, a bath, and I, the window was open, and I was just like, wow, it's so dark. And it just seemed, like, really dark. Almost like there was, like, a blanket over the sky. So I'm guessing that's the kind of night they're referring to here. Cannon had chosen a star in the Somali sky to represent her mother, who had passed away a year before. She spoke to it every night, and with no moon, 
it was especially bright on January 25th. What did you say that night? Please tell God that I need some help. We need to get out of here. You couldn't have known that that prayer would be answered that night. I had no idea. She was on a mat trying to sleep when she heard a faint scratching noise. One of the bandits she nicknamed Helper heard it too. And I see this look of just sheer terror on Helper's face. And then all of a sudden, it's just this eruption of gunfire. What was the scratching noise? And I think, okay, well, this is it. This really is truly the end. And I cover up with my blanket again, and I just start saying, oh God, oh God, oh God. And I just remember thinking, or maybe I'm saying out loud, like, I cannot survive this. She thought she was being taken by a rival group, maybe al-Shabaab, Islamic extremists who would surely kill her. And then all of a sudden, I feel all these hands on me, roughly grabbing at me. And I try to protect myself, and I pull the blanket closer on top of me, and then I hear my name. But it's not a Somali accent, it's an American accent. And I can't compute, like I can't understand that somebody with an American accent knows my name. And they say, Jessica, we're with the American military. We're here to take you home and you're safe. This entire time that she's going through this, months of just pain, <laughs> she says multiple times in this interview that she thought it, this was it, this was the end, I'm not strong enough, I can't survive this. I literally feel like I'm looking at one of the most strong people I've ever seen. She is so much stronger than she gave herself credit for. So, she is so incredibly brave. You're safe. And I pull the blanket down from my face and all I see is black, black masks, black sky, and all I can say over and over is you're American. You're American. I don't, I, I don't understand you're Americans. Thinking, how did you get here? And I, I'm still alive. And they ask me where my shoes are and I don't know. And one of them picks me up and starts running. He runs for several minutes and, and puts me down on the ground. And then they identify themselves and that they knew I was very sick and they have medicine and they have water, they have food and they've come to, to take me home. At one point, did you have a colleague though? I think they thought they heard something. Or I don't know. This group of men, who's risked their life for me already, asks me to lie down on the ground because they're concerned that there might be somewhere someone out there. And then they make a circle around me, and then they lie down on top of me to protect me. And we lay like that until the helicopters come in. When all of those seals laid down on top of you, you were the most important thing in the world to them. That's really hard to comprehend. They were gonna take a bullet for you. Mm -hmm. And they're so kind and they're so gentle and they are trying to assist me to get to the helicopter. But I think I've been out here for months I can run to this helicopter myself, and so I just break away, and I just take off running through the scrub, through the bush, and I throw myself onto that helicopter and push myself up against the wall. 
and I don't start breathing until we actually lift up off the ground. And they hand me an American flag that's folded. What did you think of that? I just started to cry. At that point in time, I have never in my life been so proud and so very happy to be an American. The SEALs left on other helicopters. She did. Ah, oh, man. Ah, oh, what incredible, inc what? Ah. Oh. What an incredible operation it must have been. Oh, man. Like, all of these things. This, it just shows, like, the level of absolute sheer incredible talent. <laughs> Scary talent that, like, individuals can possess where they just, what, come out of nowhere, few seconds of gunfire, rescued her, carried her to a helicopter, and she's safe. Just like that. Months of being trapped there. And in minutes, it was over. You know, this like longed out months of being trapped there and just like someone flicking a light switch on is over. The nightmare's over, you've woken up. These incredible human beings just like risking their lives for her, ensuring the second that she was in their arms that like their lives were forfeit for hers. The bravery that some people have, I just can't understand how humans can possess such bravery. How humans can like have an, like, how can they have like, like, the only way I can compare it is the bravery I would feel for my sons, knowing that I would I would put myself in front of any kind of danger for them, right? For my two sons. But to be able to experience that kind of emotion for people I don't know, I'm being honest, I don't know how someone can. And you hear about these soldiers that do this. I, would, I, I don't know if I'll ever be able to understand how they can be so selfless, you know? It's incredible. What happened to our colleague though? Wasn't there two of them? I'm so very happy to be an American. The SEALs left on other helicopters. She didn't see their faces, didn't hear their names. They appeared and they were gone. The only thing left in the camp were nine dead bandits. Mr. Speaker! It all ended just hours before the State of the Union address. As the president walked in, he had a secret with Defense Secretary Leon Panetta that almost no one understood until later. Good job tonight. Good job tonight. After the speech, President Obama called Buchanan's father. Jessica met her husband, Eric, at a U.S. base in Italy. I just couldn't believe he was standing there and that I was standing there. And we had a, we had a second chance. And then uh, later we flew to Portland, Oregon, and I was reunited with my father and my brother and my sister and her husband. What was the first thing you said to your father? Daddy. <laughs> I'm just, I'm so sorry that you had to go through this. She apologized. She apologized. But we made it. She apologized. What? So did her Danish co-worker, Paul Fisted, who was also rescued by the SEALs. He said later that his lucky break was being captured with an American. Jessica Buchanan has told her story I in a new- I see, I see, I see, I see, because he's Danish. I see, poor guy. Poor guy born with the wrong passport. Doesn't get the, doesn't get the story. Bless him. I'm glad he was all right as well, though. Very, very glad. I was worried for the co-worker, too. Bless him. Oh. Uh. Jesus, man. Captured with an oh. American. Jessica Buchanan has told her story in a new book, Impossible Odds, coming out this week. You may recall that she said that her first thought when being taken was that she was too young to die because she hadn't had children. Well, she's taken care of that, too. She and her husband have a baby boy, and they've moved back to the States from East Africa. Jesus, man. Oh, what a freaking story. What a story. Can you imagine? This is what I mean. It's so easy to detach ourselves from the, like, Jessica Buchanan being real. I know this sounds crazy, and maybe people will disagree with me, but it's, it's true. 
like Jesse Buchanan's a real person. And all these documentaries and stories we hear are real people, but it's so easy to detach ourselves from the fact that they're real and just see them as like forms of entertainment. I know it sounds dark, but it's true. It's, it's oddly, terrifyingly true. It's, it's, it's weird, but it is true. But the fact that this is a human being, the fact that this is, this is, this is a person that has gone through this is crazy. People, her and her, her colleague as well, her Danish colleague. <laughs> <coughs> I can't believe it. Being, being out there, the the thing that I'm like shocked about as well is the fact that it's like something that they foresee. You know, the 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 thing that surprised me the most was the phone that they literally have a phone. That they took the phone off her to call her husband, but all the numbers were disconnected other than one. And the reason was because of a situation like this happening. People get kidnapped in Somalia and they're ransomed. So they wanted it to go to um, negotiators. And the crazy part as well, that this took months. I wonder how much preparation went in behind the scenes because it seemed like the second she was ill, it was, was no time at all until they got her out. So there must've been so much like, behind the scenes, the investigation itself must be a really interesting story too. <laughs> like the behind the scenes rescue, because like what was going on? How did they find her location? Who was involved in that? Like, like, cause the Americans would have had to have known where she was and she was in like the middle of a damn desert. So it's like, how did they find out that she was there? Like what, what happened? Imagine being, imagine that, imagine like, Imagine just like, I know some, I know people. I literally know people who have gone to Africa and African countries um, just to like to do charity work for a few months. I, I know people. I've heard stories of other people I don't know as well. And, and they go out there, they get all their lovely pictures and they help loads of people and they come back and they share the stories and that's it, right? And the reason I'm saying lovely pictures is because that's where the memories lie in their stories. They come back and they show us these pictures of the people they met, the villages they went to, and what they and they tell stories of what they did. And we all we've all heard these stories. And it's crazy to think that one of those people that I knew, like this could just happen to them, you know? It really like humanizes the story. Because People just go out there, do these things and come home. And that's what you expect. This poor woman to go through what she went through, the amount of times that she accepted death, believing this was it as well. No human should ever have to do that until they're old and gray and lying in a bed comfortable with a smile on their face. But she had to multiple times believe and accept that this was it for her. Yeah, well, what a terrifyingly incredible story. Anyway, I um, I'm gonna I'm gonna end the video there. Wow, all all I all I'll say is I'm so glad she's safe. She seems like a really good soul, and we need more people like that. So, I'm glad she's safe, and I'm sure she's gonna be the best freaking mother ever. I don't know how old this is, but I imagine she is a wonderful mother. And I imagine her husband is a wonderful father. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for watching this video. Again, I know these reactions are a little bit different, but you guys seem to like them. So hopefully you enjoyed it. Please like the video and subscribe for more. And let me know in that comment section what other reactions you would love to see. What would you like to see similar to this? Put them all down below. Have yourself an amazing day. Thank you very much for watching. And as always, my friends, you will see me in the next video.